Hey everyone, you know the hardest part of the videos is the very first part because I never know what to say or how to say it. Um, but today's video is a Q&A and these questions come from people who support myself on Patreon. And in the past I've made these private and sometimes I would publicly do a live stream or whatnot in the second half of it. But um, I've decided to switch things up a little bit and post these questions that Patreon supporters have given me publicly and kind of just record this in a more formal or official setting than a, a live stream. So hopefully people can get some use out of these answers as I, I don't know how useful they are, but you know, let's, yeah, let, let's do this. In, in the future, like, so I got a lot of questions from uh, my Patreon supporters, which is fantastic. Um, so I didn't have any public questions in here. If in the future there's not so many, um, questions from Patreon supporters. Maybe I'll take some questions in, in from the public as well. Um, I guess part of the reason for making this public is, or the major reason really, is, you know, I, I spend time thinking about the answers and um, I like communicating with people. That's why I do this. So I, I just, it feels, instead of just limit, limiting it to, you know, 15 people or 30 people or 100 people, it's nice for others to benefit from the answers whether or not you can support financially, because I grew up, uh, I, 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 when I grew up, I wouldn't have had the money to um, support something like how the Patreon supporters are supporting me. So <laughs> I want to make this available to people who could really maybe gain something from the answers. Uh, anyways, that's my awkward way of uh, introducing this whole thing. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe, sorry, uh, I'll just go back to it is maybe I'll try to take a question or two from different social media like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, just to have a little chance of some people to get some questions in uh, officially. But I'd like to do this once a month on a regular basis. Um, anyways, I'll get to the first question for this February session, which is from Mix Valarchia, and I probably pronounced that wrong, sorry. Um, Hi Greg, when you're out in the city and want a quick meal, what restaurant or food would you recommend? This is both an easy and a hard question because I think um, there's so much different types of food you can eat. I'm just going to answer this from a personal perspective is that when I'm out and about and on the go and like I said, quick, he said quick, um, it's either kombini, that's ultra quick. You can just grab like um, onigiri or any, any of their, like a bun or something like a pizza ma or a nikuma bun um, or you could go to a place like a ramen restaurant where you can just quickly order and eat and get out or any type of noodles, any, any, any of the menya. So udon, soba, ramen, you know, that type of thing. So that's what I'd recommend. Uh, Stefan Brownstein, if someone at school asked your kids what your work is, what would they answer? Uh, I'm, ass I'm assuming that Shin would just pretty much say that I, I make videos on YouTube. Uh, I, th I think that's what he'd answer. Um, Aiko, I think she'd be a bit more cautious with her words. She might say I make videos, but she probably wouldn't say where. Um, but some of her friends do know that we make videos now, so they, they, they wouldn't be asking her. But for those that don't, then I'm assuming that's what she would say. Ryan Ojeda, uh, you asked a, asked a lot of questions. I'll just pick one of them. Um, you can ask ne next month if you want another question for sure. Uh, what in your life has changed most since moving to Japan? Um, I would say I have, I have more quality time with my family. And I guess part of the reason is that in Canada, I had a lot more, I mean, I had my own small business shooting videos and I was producing for businesses and you just have to take whatever business you get as much as you can, like, because your business goes up and down month to month. And so some months you'll be really busy, make a lot of money. Other months you'll make nothing. So you just have to take the work when you can get it. And sometimes that can be an unstable, you know, life. And I mean, I'm working for myself still now over here. Um, but I guess I was able to throw away some of the things that I did in Canada that I was just so used to after having doing it for so many years and just say, no, I don't have to do that anymore. And also kind of think about what's, 
what do you value in life? Is it, is it money or your time or you know your family and friends and whatnot? So I think I've purposely taken more time for um, to not burn myself out um, like I would in previous work. Um, but an another thing with that is just the structure of the life. Um, I live in Tokyo and don't need to own a car. And so like grocery shopping is just a couple minutes walk away. I can do a lot of things just via bike. So a uh, commute time has gone down a lot. And um, I think it's it's a more like compact geographically lifestyle. So less run, running around doing things like that. Um, now Kane E asks, something I've been curious about as for work culture. Often in the Western world, there is a bit of stigma around jobs such as retail working, working at fast food places, receptionists, etc, etc. They are thought of as bad jobs and something for teenagers, retirees, uneducated people, lazy people, you get the picture. Particularly, the middle class seem to promote the stigma. Is it similar in Japan? Either way, what? why do you think this is? Um, I think there's a clear definition or, or, or differentiation between uh, shine Seishain and like Arubaito and Arubaito is like part-time job uh, Seishain is full-time employee. So I think people who are full-time employees um, That's kind of more like a, a real job or a serious career um, It doesn't necessarily have to be a, like a high-up job, but it just means that It's taken more seriously. I think uh, whereas Arubaito you're like oh, I have this Arubaito even if you're working that part-time job for 30 hours a week or, you know, 35 or 40 hours a week, you know, it's still a kind of not a, as high as a level. Um, I haven't talked to enough Japanese people asking that specific question to give a solid answer. Um, but one thing I do know related to that area is I think people take more pride in those types of jobs. Um, something I noticed um, whether and this is in media so I won't even talk about just working in these places but just in the media like if you look at Hollywood TV show or movies or, or TV shows you know produced from America it's kind of cool to think like your job your part-time job it's like oh they're not paying me anything so screw this job I'll do this I'll steal from my employer or, you know, like, uh, are the customers mean to me, I'll get them back and do this bad thing to them. Like, I think it's, it's a normalized thing. And I don't think you realize it until you kind of step out of the, out of it a bit or watch different media produced from different countries. Um, I think in Japan, the theme for working is, I mean, there, there's like abuse from employers. That's part of it. Abuse from customers that people endure, but it's more like something like that, the gambare, like they have to get through it. They're not purposely trying to sabotage their jobs. Or maybe it's just the type of Japanese media I watch where it's more of um, happy stories or something like that. But uh, that's one thing I did notice. And I think it's true if you go to Japanese like stores, like where they have arubaito, like, yeah, like convenience store or, you know, go to an ice cream parlor or something. Um, the service tends to be, you, you feel like people are taking pride in their jobs a lot more. Um, I still think they have frustrations with their jobs. Maybe just even the mental attitude of like who you take it out on, like your, your, your frustrations, whether you kind of like maybe internalize them or have to endure them versus saying this person's to blame for my problem. And because of that, I will do this other thing. That's a negative thing. Right. So, um, I kind of. I've had a lot of part-time jobs or a lot of um, service level jobs in Canada and I guess what part of the reason I respect the Japanese work culture in certain aspects of it at least is that I've always felt that I mean if I'm not performing well at a place either I quit it because I just I can't mesh well with it or else I kind of endure it or make the best of it so um, I don't think the Japanese people don't quit it like I would have that attitude in, in Canada, but they definitely kind of try to make the best of it, I feel, or endure it. So I kind of relate to that second half. Uh, done a gig. 
Donna Gig. Is your family watching the Olympics much? Any sports you're especially looking forward to? Any sports that have captured your family's attention that you didn't expect? Notice any differences in how the Olympics are covered in Japan, Japanese media compared to coverage in Canada? Um, no, we actually haven't watched much of the Olympics. Um, the kids did watch in school. I know that uh, when I, I generally don't watch much Japanese TV. Uh, anything I watch is probably on, on Netflix. They do have Japanese drama, anime, and and whatnot. So I'll watch stuff on there. Um, I just I really don't like commercials and uh, a lot of the variety shows. But the Olympics actually there's there's not a lot of that. It's it's NHK. So the coverage I think is fairly similar to Canada actually, where um, at least at the NHK level, how they're covering it, it's a lot more. Um, what is it? more fact reporting, I guess, less less hype than, say, like stuff I've seen in America. Now, that being said, if you go to other channels, um, they could be repeating the same thing over and over about like some Japanese athlete who did something great, and which they did, but it's just, it kind of, uh, I like to see the overall picture a little bit better. But um, we haven't, why haven't we watched Olympics, though? I don't know. Like, I'm just not a big sports watcher, and I don't think the family is either so I think like personally I love doing sports way more than I like watching people do sports my family's they just never watch any sports so that's probably why we did watch the opening ceremonies though um jock tf this one's the easiest question I'd like to see you go to an alpaca farm I guess that's not really a question that's a suggestion um okay if I see alpaca farm I'll uh, I'll go to one <laughs> Candice Webster would you consider doing a documentary on the war, specifically how it has changed the people, their view towards others, shaped the current society, and how they are pres preserving areas that were once war-torn and making them beautiful again? Um, I really want to do a mini-documentary on children who lived through the war, World War II in Japan. And the inspiration for this is my wife's family who in fact were just young kids like under 10 years old and even you know toddler at the time the war broke out uh, or was was going on and and actually the family survived the fire bombing of Tokyo Tokyo and um it's it's cr it's yeah it felt crazy really hearing the story because you know I've seen the film footage I've read the stories and you hear about how people have, I mean, they just firebombed and killed hundreds of thousands of people in Tokyo. And I mean, the whole place was burning up, burning up and uh, horrible deaths. And to hear that aunt was strapped to her mother's back and was, you know, escaping the city at that time, that was really powerful. And um, it kind of makes you think about war in a different way um and like like for example my grandpa he fought against the japanese actually and we all celebrate this and um he he didn't celebrate you know the things that he had to do but he was proud of you know being part of the war effort if, if that makes sense right like he he's not a i don't think he's not a killer Right? He had to kill people in his job. He never talked about... Because I asked him, how many people did you shoot down? He flew Hawker Hurricanes, and he wouldn't say. And um, now I understand why. But, you know, when I was asking him, I was like Shin's age or something. So it was just like, oh, like a... You know, you're shooting down planes, cool, that type of thing. So um, I, I'd like to cover that aspect of the war story in Japan. Because I think there were bad things done on all sides. Um... And I've read a, a bit on the, the history of World War II. It's kind of a, I don't know, it was, I, would you call it a hobby? I, I don't know. It's, it's interest of mine. Um, but, like, another example is my mom asked me about the war. And she's been doing some genealogy research, so researching our roots. And so she was following my grandpa's, her father's war efforts. And um, then she read about atrocities that were committed, you know, from the Japanese side. And she just thought, wow, like, it kind of didn't, in her head, she can't understand how 
you know, like she knows my wife, right? And, and, and all my, and the Japanese side of the family. And it's like this disconnect, right? Like how these two the same people. And um, so I'd like to just, I guess, bring it like the human part of the story to it. So that, I mean, war, I believe it's fought by really like, you know, the higher ups are deciding who dies, who, who lives. And um, the regular people, like, you know, there's innocent people, right? At those times. And um, yeah, lots of innocent people were dying on both sides. And I just like to try to tell that story a bit. I thought it was very powerful, it affected me. And it made me kind of think more about, you know, the war and what happened and just how, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really anti-war. Uh, yeah. Anyways, moving on. Um, Kobe Tang. So I have a few questions. Can you talk a bit about the difference between JR uh, and the local city metros? I know they are not all publicly owned, but I know a lot of people get confused with them and end up buying the wrong tickets or even lost their way. I know I had. I find it fascinating that Japan public transit is not centrally organized, and so switching metros could be a hassle for tourists. For instance, Tokyo has Tokyo Metro, to Toei, Chikatetsu, and JR East. Um, we once entered Tokyo Metro in Asakusa, but we shouldn't entered. We should have entered Toei, and we couldn't get out. I know the IC car could take care of the ticket problem, but the the different rail operators within Japan cities could use some explaining. Also, I'm coming to Tokyo Kansai this summer for the fourth time, and I don't know any spot I need to visit that I haven't already visited. So do you have any suggestions? Um, yeah. So the train systems, I, I guess, um, they, they, they can be confusing, I'll, I'll just say that. Um, and the different lines really messed me up too, because you hear about, like, yeah, Asakusa, there's like the Ginza, you know, station, and there's the, um, uh, the, what's the other line that goes to it? Is it Toei? Is it different than Ginza? I, I don't even know. I can't remember, honestly. Like, there's some, there's, there are different operators. Um, now, the good thing is, is that, like you mentioned, you can use your IC card um, on any of the operated lines. So, it doesn't matter. So, generally, I don't even think about who's running the line because I just use my IC card. I don't travel that often. I don't have special passes. And um, that's not a worry for me. So, I, I don't buy the tickets. Um, and I think the tickets are confusing, so that's why I recommend anybody coming to just get the IC card. Um, they, yeah, they're not run by the same operators, and, hmm, I don't know, I just think that's the way it is, and that's the way it kind of grew up. And, and actually, I think it was more privatized at one point, but then, or, or sorry, it was publicly owned, at least JR was, and then they split it up. Um, I don't know all the history of it, but um, it's confusing, but at least, I mean, it's it's a great transportation system. Yeah. Uh, for, for for your tourist spots question, I will, I'm trying to make some videos about that um, in the next few months. So hopefully by summertime, I'll have some types, more content about that kind of thing. Kevin Flynn, he says, in one of your videos, I remember noticing that one of the girls was very clearly writing with her left hand. Now, I'd always understood that Japan has traditionally come down very heavily on naturally left-handed children, more or less forcing them to use their right hand for writing, etc. Is this no longer the case? Sorry if this sounds like a trivial question, but I think it may have some relevance to the issue of Japan as a strongly conformist society and whether or not and to what extent this is changing. I think that's a very good question, um, Kevin. And people have asked me this before because they noticed that Shin is left-handed. And he writes left-handed into his textbooks and whatnot. So I don't think they, they, as far as I know, they haven't tried to change him. Although I haven't specifically asked him in recent times. I must have asked him like a couple of years ago. Now for Shuji, which is like the Japanese calligraphy, I mean, it's all kind of, at least taught, I believe, from like perspective of using your, your right hand to do that. I'd be... I'm curious, actually. I'll have to ask him about does he use his left or right hand. I'm I, I'm pretty sure he uses his left hand. Um, times are changing um, in the school systems, in the workplaces, and that's a, a huge reason I make these videos because I think there's a lot of you know stuff that used to be true 20, 30 years ago that's not so true today. Um, things are definitely changing in the workplace and in the school 
uh, which I hope to tell you more about. Okay, M. George, let's see. What plans do you have for Aiko and Shin's future education? I know you mentioned a while back that your family had moved to Japan because you wanted Aiko and Shin to be more in touch with their Japanese roots, but do you plan on staying in Japan while they go through middle high school? The reason I'm asking is because I know that in middle and especially high school, the emphasis is placed more on entrance exams for college, and from what I've heard, it can be quite stressful on students compared to student life in Canada. So, yeah, we do plan on going back to Japan at some point of the kids' education, um, probably for a few years chunk of it. And I think the overall reason is because we want the kids to be able to, to succeed in either place, whether it's Japan or Canada. And to do that, you not only need the language, but you also need the kind of the culture and the credentials. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've, we've been in Japan for nearly five years now. So it's, it's been a while, a time flies by really fast. And I mean, we, we, I, I, we purposely try to go back to Japan for good chunks of time on a regular basis to make sure they don't forget their, their family. They don't forget what it's like being in Canada. I think, um, with the global, the, I think the world as much, I mean, in some ways it's becoming less global with the Brexit and Trump and whatnot. But I mean, I think the overall trend is the world is becoming a more global place and I think more than just a formal university education, uh, which, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll attend. Um, but I think more to, to me, more important to that would be for them to have an education on, or being able to bridge the gap between, uh, bridge Japanese and Canadian cultures and be fluent in both languages and both styles of, of, of doing things. I think that will be the best thing that I could do for my kids. Um, so I think that necessitates going back to Canada um, at some point in time for a decent chunk of time. Now, we do own a house in Japan and um, do not plan on selling it. Uh, I, I think we're comfortable in either country. And I think the kids, their comfort in either country changes depending on, you know, their moods and whatnot. But I think they can get along in either country and going back to Canada last year, I think that kind of proved it. Um, so th that was actually a big relief is that, yeah, we can still make it in Canada. <laughs> so, so that was nice. Um, but if you talk about after high school, I think, um, we just want to set the kids up. So once they're done high school, they're, they're adults, so they can kind of technically do whatever they like with their lives. And so I want them to have the opportunity to say, okay, I want to go to university in Canada or I want to go to university in Japan, or I don't want to go to university, I want to start my own business in Canada, or do whatever, whatever it is they want to do, that they can actually do it. I think that's that's kind of my responsibility as, as their parent, and same as my, my wife's responsibility as well. Um, I didn't answer the, sorry, the, the entrance examination question, and I think that's probably, and that would factor into it. Um, so entrance exams, it, what, what you're talking about, and just so people who don't know about it, is elementary school, I think, is generally fairly, I don't know, it's not bad. People talk about the Japanese school system being really harsh or hard and strict. I think elementary school in Japan is not as harsh as it's made out to be. Now, once you start getting to middle school and high school, I think the pressure mounts. And sometimes... It can be at the elementary school level because maybe you want to get into a certain middle school, which is a feeder for a certain high school, which is a feeder for a certain university, and it just kind of snowballs there. But I think that's probably more of a problem or a concern of, I don't know, I'll just say like the 1% or the top 5%, like I'm, we're not part of that and we don't have money for private schools and that kind of thing. And I just don't believe in that sort of like that pressure on kids. So. You know, it's not a concern for, for our family. Um, but, for example, my nephew, Sota, uh, you've, you guys have seen him on the channel a few times. He just got into a technical school that is like a high school slash university kind of degree. It's, 
I'll have to talk about it hopefully with him later on. Um, but he, he got in and he was studying for a solid year going to like Chuku, which is the cram schools. And it was, it was like similar to a pressure, I would say, of somebody trying to get into a top university in, in Canada, like that type of commitment to succeeding and, and the stakes seemed that high. Um, so he was in middle school and he was trying to get into this high school and he was, but now that he's in high school, I mean, he has to get you know, grades to continue on and stuff like that. But it's kind of like, that's kind of, he's in there. Then I think the pressure, I think it, it lowers a little bit. Um, now there is going to be a change in the school system in Japan. Um, by the time our kids get to the university level, apparently they're changing the whole entrance examination system. I don't know exactly what they're doing. It's supposed to help lessen the pressure and, and change it. So I'm really hopeful for what will come out of it, but I don't know yet what it'll be, but it's something that I'd like to cover. Okay, so that's it for the questions. I'm glad I could do this um, uncut because, you know, editing takes a long time and having to listen to yourself again is, is tiresome, you know. <laughs> but thanks for all the Patreon supporters. Uh, if you have any comments on what I talked about, please leave comments. I'll try to answer them for the first day or two. And um, hopefully we can do, well, yeah, let's do this again next month. All right. Catch you on the flip side.